morning, I want to do part three. We've been, we've been dealing with seasons. We've been dealing with seed time and harvest. So we started off a couple weeks ago. If you've missed it, you can go on the YouTube channel and catch it. We started off with seed and defining what a seed is. Um, and, and so many times we want to bend skip from seed to harvest. But last week we talked about time. What do we do in that middle section when we have seed in the ground and we're waiting on harvest? Now, boys, you can't preach with me already. This is their first Sunday out, so if you get a chance to say hi to the boys, what a crew, man. Lord, help us. Uh, but what do you do in that time between the time you put the seed in the ground and when you gain your harvest? So that was last week. This week, I want to talk to you about your harvest. You know, there is, there is uh, a time in our life when it's okay to reap. It's okay to have a harvest. Do you realize the scripture said that God wants you to prosper? Now, all of a sudden, when we hear that prosper, everybody goes towards the prosperity message and they think that we're talking about money. Well, money is just the tip of the little iceberg. Okay, we're talking about so much more than just money. But if we could, let's, uh, our, you know, our base scriptures over in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm not going to go through and read all those times for you again. But it says that there's a time for everything under heaven. So there is a time to sow and there is a time to reap. What we've got to determine in our life is what season and what time am I in? Because, John, you don't want to sow in the harvest season and you don't want to harvest in the sowing season. You want to plant your garden when you're supposed to. Doesn't do you any good to plant the garden and then it snows. Okay, that doesn't do a whole lot of good. Grandma used to get real upset because most of the time she would plant her potatoes on Good Friday. She just believed in that. But it was really upsetting to her if it snowed after that. Okay, so we don't want to move in the wrong season. We want to move in the correct season. But do you realize, Amanda, when you're born, you're born with potential for success. All the potential of everything that you want to accomplish in your life is already in you. Everything. But the situation that happens, and we talked about this some yesterday. What's that? Uh, sort of, yeah. <laughs> the, men's, the men's group got to get some of this yesterday morning. The, the, the situation is this. Our environment, how we grow up, uh, what we believe about ourselves changes our potential. We begin to believe lies, so the potential that's in it, we never develop. We start hearing things like, you're stupid. You can't do that. Don't go take that risk because uh, the result of that is going to be negative. And we start believing those things. But God placed inside of you greatness. Every one of us. But how many of us actually move in that greatness that God placed inside of us? If we look around, the majority of people are living in lack. Financial lack, yes. Emotional lack, yes. Relational lack, yes. All of those areas. But God put in you the abilities to be successful. It's a lovely little word called potential. And that word, Jimmy, used to make me really mad. I always, I kept hearing all the time, man, you've got great potential. you got potential. you got potential. I don't want to throat punch him. You know, can we be, can we be honest about it? Amen. Yeah, see? You know, it's all this potential, potential, potential. I don't want to hear about potential. I, not, I began to say, God, how do I take potential and make it reality? John, do we all have potential to be wealthy? Absolutely. If we work correctly, if we invest wisely, if we increase in knowledge, and we increase in understanding, we have the potential to be good at everything. But the problem that we run into 
is our core belief systems. And we blame it on mom and dad. We blame it on grandma and grandpa. We blame it on all these things. And we're at this point in time in our life where we've got to stop blaming and we got to stop, start doing. Because potential will remain potential until we wake up and start working. I don't want the potential of my life. I don't want the potential of greatness. I want to experience it. I want to have the most healthy relationships that you can have. Aren't you tired of, uh, how can I put it, draining people? I was going to say suckers, but I, aren't you tired of draining people that every time you're around them, it just seems like they zap the strength out of you? I want healthy relationships that when we sit down and talk and I, my phone rings, I don't have to go, oh my God, do I have to answer that? I know you guys don't do that. I'm the only one that does that. But thank God for caller ID. Because then I can make the decision, do I really want to answer this call or not? But that's because the relationships that we have and the things that we have are not healthy. Either we're not healthy or the person on the other end of the line is not healthy. So we've got to begin to develop and help each other become healthy. Because the word says that every joint supplies. You are a joint. No, not that kind of joint. You're this kind of joint, okay? You are a joint that supplies something to my life. Because why? Because we have, at some level, a relationship. Some, some people are closer than others. Some are just acquaintances. But an acquaintance brings something into your life. Some are family. Good Lord, help us. Nothing we can do about that. It's just what it is. But it supplies something to you. It gives you something. I can remember talking to my mom uh, a few years ago. You know, my mom and dad got divorced when I was in first grade. I grew up without a dad. I went 11 years at one point in time, never saw my dad. So statistically... I should be in prison. I should have killed somebody or something. Like that. But I hit a point in time in my life where I realized that God needed my dad and my mom to make me. Isn't that a great revelation? Bing. The personalities of my father, everybody would tell me he's terrible, you're gonna grow up and be just like him. Well, my father was a very successful businessman. He was, what, he was in retail, and he was what was referred to as a troubleshooting manager. If a store was in trouble, John, they sent him in. And he was known as a hatchet man. He came in, and he cut out everything that was wrong and rebuilt it, put the store back up on his feet, and it would take him, on average, two years. He was an influencer of people. People loved him. Scared to death of him, but they loved him. And when he would come in, he would fire everybody in the store. And he would put a table out on the sidewalk and say, you can go outside and put an application in. And most generally, he would hire everybody back with the exception of the general manager. Because he said, if you were doing your job, we wouldn't be in this situation. So he, he would see problems and he would solve problems. God needed that trait in me because of what I do. And my mom, those of you who were exposed to my mom through the years, she was a lovely lady, a great worshiper, but she was hard. It was the letter of the law and everything was King James black and white, period. When I was growing up, if it didn't have four parts and mentioned Jesus' name five times in the song, I wasn't allowed to listen to it. You know, the, our bedtime stories was the King James Bible and we were memorizing. Good things, but I'm telling you what, she was tough. And there was no, there was no pad to her hammer. Donna experienced the hammer once or twice. There was no pad to that hammer. She was saying things to you. She loved you, but her love was pretty tough. And, and I would look at, and they would say, you gotta watch your mom, she's just mean. 
No, this woman had so much knowledge, so much passion about what she did, she came across harsh. She was a high D personality. All right? And it, she, when she come across, it was a poof. But I had to reach a realization that I could make excuses. Did my dad have character weaknesses? Absolutely. He was married five times. There's a character flaw. There was an issue. He couldn't hold on to relationships. You know, and, and what, what did he, he also had a drinking problem. It's what killed him. He died at 72 years old. Drank himself to death. Was there char- Absolutely, there were character flaws. There were things in his life that were not right. But I could either go, well, poor woe is me. It's terrible. I can never reach my potential because my daddy wasn't there. I could say that. And society would look at me and say what? You're right, you poor little boy. But God doesn't say, he said, no, 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 this isn't a great excuse. This is an opportunity for you to learn. This is an opportunity for you to develop your potential and become great. To take the things that you learned, do you realize that mistakes are not the best teacher? Listen to this, Chad, you might need this. You don't have to make mistakes. You can, what do I tell them in class all the time? God gave you two ears and one mouth. Shut up. (laughs) Listen for just a minute. I really do know what I'm talking about. And there's, there's times we talked about the lesser and greater voices at the table. You know, if we're talking about uh, counseling and those type of things, that's, that's my specialty. That's what I do. But if we're talking about woodworking, I'm going to go to Ben because that's what Ben does. And at that point in time, even though I'm Dr. Doug and he's Ben, you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. At that point in time, Ben has the expertise of what I need to talk about. If we're talking about financial investments, don't talk to me. Talk to John. Why? He studies it. He looks at it. He does it. So at that point in time, guess what I get to do? Shut up. Exercise the two ears that God put. And then my potential for good investments, my potential to gain wealth can grow because I'm learning from somebody that does it. Does it make sense? So, I don't care how much you think you know. I make a statement to Chad all the time. Forget about being a welder, man. You're not in welding class. We're in machining. So you may think you can fix it by striking an arc. But let me show you how to fix it right. That's what machinists do. We fix welders' mistakes. But we take our potential of who we are and we develop it through work. Last week, we talked about the parable of the talents. You find that over in Matthew chapter 25. The parable of the talents is when the, the, the owner of the vineyard was leaving and he, had, he gave talents five, two, and one. Okay? He goes through and read the scriptures. Each one of those servants had potential. Each one of them had potential for increase. So two of them doubled their potential and made it their reality. How did they do it? They invested. They invested their time. They sowed their seeds. They did the things necessary. One of them said, potential, I'm going to bury it. I'm going to set on it. I'm going to do nothing with it. What did God say about him? You wicked servant. Why did you squander the potential that I gave you? When I arrive at heaven, I don't want God to look at me and say, you could have been so much more. I want him to look at me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. My mom used to put it this way. I want to die empty. In other words, I don't want any unleft things. I don't want a book unwritten 
I don't want a song unsung. I don't want a relationship unfulfilled. I want to give everything that I have to fulfill the greatness of what God says about me. Dr. Keith Johnson puts it this way. What you do not honor, you will lose. But what you honor, you will gain. When we talk about honoring something, something you honor, you take care of it. You nurture, it has value to you. You know, we watch and we learn. Uh, it was when I got my first job living at home, uh, I, I, I didn't understand the value of a dollar. So when I got a paycheck, between the house, between the, 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 the bank and home, I could blow it all. It was really easy to do. You know, you had to stop by McDonald's and pick up a, a you know, and you, and you just have to have this. I've got to have this gun. I've got to have these clothes. I've got to have this. And then all of a sudden, we're only a week into the pay period and I have no money because I didn't understand the value of a dollar. So a wise man in my life says, we're going to teach you the value of a dollar. When you get your paycheck, bring it to me. So I brought it to him and we sit out with my paycheck and he started to budget. That's a bad word. I don't like that word. But you know, it was necessary to take the potential of my paycheck and be able to fulfill the full potential of it. It wasn't a great paycheck. I was in high school. I was working at a grocery store. But what he began to do is he, he, he would take, and so much of that went to help my mom. She was raising four of us by herself. All right? I was training for college football at the time. I needed to eat more than what she could support me eating. All right? I needed proteins. You know, a lot of times we ate just vegetables out of the garden. But I was balking to play football. So he taught me how to buy my own groceries. She sectioned me off a section in the freezer. I bought my own groceries. And at that point in time, I learned to win, win wing cook-offs because I had to learn to cook. Oh, wait a minute, that's later. I had to learn to cook. So I had to learn the value of cooking. If you don't cook well, oh, I've ruined some good steaks. It's, it's wrong. But now, hallelujah. But that potential of had to become fulfilled, and it came through hard work. It came through learning. I did not want to learn how to manage money. It's no fun. It's no fun having to manage money. If you don't manage money, you're going to have a blast, but you're going to have nothing. Man, it's quiet in this church this morning. You're... <laughs> It, you're going to go and go and go and go and win and win and win. But when it comes down to where the rubber meets the road and you have a need in your life or it comes time to buy that vehicle or buy that house or go to college, you're all of a sudden going to turn around and you're going to say, Mom, Dad, I have nothing. What do I do? Well, what my mom told me was suck it up, buttercup. I got nothing to give you. Go get a loan. I learned, I had to invest. There are things that I want to do in my life. So I had to invest in my education to get there. So I took the advice of my uncle. When I was 18 years old, and well, 17, I graduated from high school. I got in the fight with my mom because she wouldn't sign my papers to play college football. At that point in time, to go into college at 17, you had to have a signature. She said, no, son, you're going to Bible school. I said, no, I'm going to play ball. We fought. I joined the Navy. My uncle said, become a machinist, you'll never starve. And as you can see, I haven't missed many meals. <laughs> and he was right. But you know, the fight I had with my mom, she was also right. I went to Bible school. I got my bachelor's degree in, from Bible school. Then I got my uh, master's degree in Christian counseling. And then I set a goal. I said, by the time I'm 50, I want to have that doctorate. And I was 49 when I, but what did it take? I had to learn the hard way. 
I had to fight with mom, go to the Navy, go all the way around Robin Hood's barn to land where I could have landed at 25. But instead, I didn't land till 50. There's no reason for you to go around that same trip. Listen, I realize, young people, you might think mom and dad are idiots. We are, but we're educated idiots. We've experienced some things. So instead of looking at us and saying, I don't want to be where you are, good, learn from my mistakes. Don't do the same things I did. Let me tell you the path that I took so that you don't have to make that same, so your potential doesn't have to wait till you're 50. Your potential can happen at 25. Your potential can happen at 18. What is potential? Definition of potential. Having or showing the capacity to become. Do you have the potential and capacity to become? Absolutely. As long as there's breath in your body, you have the potential to become. But what happens is you have to decide, am I going to honor that potential? Now, there are some things in my life that I don't have the potential to become. The potential's probably there, but the talent may not be there. Okay, my kids will tell you, if you're building a wall, don't call me. Because I inevitably will cut on the wrong side of the line and you'll be a quarter inch short. And the wall will look more like this. As long as you lean to the side, everything's good. All right, woodworking is not my strong suit. I need to develop new technology called a board stretcher. It would so much help. Now, you give me a piece of metal. We're in my wheelhouse now. Okay? I'm good. Now, the other thing is, if you take and stick me in a room and make me a bean counter, I'm going to go crazy. Because I have to talk to people. Why? Because I'm good at it. One thing God blessed me with is the ability to talk. The only person that can out-talk me is Mike Taylor. But I can, I can talk. And, and, and so when I start looking at my potential, when I start looking at my talents, I have, sure, I, I know math. I'm a machinist. We do math. We do a lot of it. But don't lock me in a room and make me do math all day because then I'm going to go... <laughs> At least give me a window where I can look at the birds. Something that I can have contact. Because my strengths are in contact with people. Making that. So I begin to honor that. So I study. I become a certified behavioral consultant so that I can analyze you. People all the time look at me, why are you analyzing me? Because that's what I do. I love it. I can tell you when you're crazy. You're, trust me, you are all certifiably crazy. No, uh, wait. What's the definition of insanity, Ben? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. How many of you are insane? <laughs> See, you're all certifiably crazy, and it didn't take ten minutes for me to figure that out. It's true, but we have to develop in ourselves. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4. In the New King James, it says it this way. The soul of a lazy man desires, but has nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Hmm. You have anything? Are you in one of those places, I have nothing? You can get mad if you want to, but the Word of God says you're lazy. You're not putting in the effort. If we do read it from the New Living Translation, it says this. Lazy people want much, but get little. I want, I want, I want. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But you'll never succeed. There's a ceiling to that. You want to remove the ceiling, but those that work hard will prosper. 
See, so many times, Mama Rose, we love that prosperity message. God wants you to succeed. He wants you to have much. He wants to pour out a blessing upon you that you don't have room enough to contain. He wants, and we want to grab a hold of that. Woohoo! But when we turn around and look at you, say, but you have to work for it. Are you telling me that the blessings of God are not free? Absolutely, that's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that salvation is free. That's a free gift that comes from God, but you still have to do something. You have to ask and you have to receive. Then after that, we had creation. The only miracle that I've found so far listed in the scriptures that did not require something from us. When God created man, it did not require anything from us. It was a miracle. But every other miracle in the scriptures required something of the receiver. It required you to do something. Dip seven times in a river. Go borrow vessels so you could fill them with oil. It required you to do something. Your potential was, the little widow woman's potential was oil. She said, I don't have a lot. God says, you believe me? You trust me? Let's do something. Go borrow a bunch of empty vessels. But God, that doesn't make any sense. Do you want your miracle? Do what God asks you to do. Don't come to my office and whine that God's not fulfilling and meeting your needs. Because the question is going to be, what did God ask you to do? He didn't ask anything. Well, you ain't listening. I know that wasn't proper English, but that's okay. You got it, right? Don't judge me, Amanda. <laughs> All right. We go out and he, she borrowed the vessels. Now came the second level of faith. Go in and fill them up. What am I going to fill them with? Your potential. And she goes to that first vessel. And I, I, in my mind, my mind plays this way. She found the smallest one in the room. And she said, okay, God. And she began to pour. And it was full. She said, hmm. There's more potential in me. She steps to the next level, a little bigger container. She pours. What happened to it? It was full until her potential, the little potential she thought, that's the way she saw it, filled every vessel that she borrowed. And then they said to her, now go sell it. So that was invest your potential all of this greatness that you have. And the word of God says it paid all her bills and she lived the rest of her life with lack. No, that's not what it says. She paid all her bills and what'd she do with the rest of it? She lived off the rest. So the potential, that little bit of potential that was in her, that everybody said, you just have a little oil. Oh, you're just a little church in, in North Central West Virginia. Oh, you're just... Oh, you're just, there's no way you can be an author. There's no way you could be uh, a blessing. There's no way you can be. Do you realize that most successful coaches right now in the NCAA came from West Virginia? Whoop, whoop. Do you know one of the largest churches in the world or at least in the United States, is pastored by a little man, well, a big man, from Charleston, West Virginia. Everybody knows him as T.D. Jakes. Little potential, little potential that became great. He's now a CEO of many companies, six, I think. Wow. And he doesn't struggle now to figure out whether or not he can pay his power bill. He probably doesn't get the red letter edition anymore. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you may not. Let your power bill go too long, too long, they send you the word of God. It's the red letter edition that says, I will shut you off. But that little bit of potential because of work. I've told you the story before. There was a pastor, a young pastor that came up to T.D. Jakes and said, I want what you have. Will you pray for me? So Bishop Jake says, sure, I'll pray for her. Lays hands on him and said, God, repossess his car. 
shut off his power, make him go hungry, make him lose his, and he, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. I want what you have. He said, to get what I have, you've got to go through what I went through. You've got to go through the process of. You've got to learn. You've got to submit yourself. In John Maxwell's book, Thinking for a Change, it's a great title for a book. Thinking for a change, either do something different and think or think to get somewhere else, however you want to interpret it, okay? But he says this, a man came to him and says, John, I'm frustrated. My company is a million dollar company. Would that frustrate you? No, we'd be like, whoo-hoo, million dollar company. Hallelujah, God's blessing me. He said, I'm frustrated. I cannot break the billion dollar barrier. That wouldn't frustrate me. I'd be okay. But this frustrated this guy. So John just simply said this, who are your friends? He said, well, all of my friends are multimillionaires. John, he said, that's your problem. You're hanging out with people that can teach you to be a millionaire. Maybe you should hang out with somebody that has become a billionaire that can show you how to do it. I want to be a success in this job. <laughs> Find somebody that's successful in that career and learn. Latch on to them. Get a hold of them. Get all the information you can from them. Bleed them dry. Because they can teach you how to be what you want. It's honoring the gift that's inside of you and you become more. Psalms 35 verse 27 says this about the Lord. The, the last part of the verse says, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. This was the thing that, that hit me, Dan, between the eyes. God likes it when you prosper. What that says to him is he has, the, these people value the potential that I put inside of them because they prosper. So what's the difference between potential and harvest? Where does it come? How do, we, how do we get there? John Maxwell has 15 irrefutable laws of growth. Potential says this. I'll start tomorrow. Potentially. Harvest says we're doing it today. Today, I start. Potential says, growth will happen. Lord, bless me. And you sit down on the porch, you eat cheap puff and bonbons and just wait for the blessings of God. Harvest says, I'll take responsibility for my growth. I'm going. Potential learns only from mistakes. Have you met those individuals that have to beat their head against the wall? They have to, but harvest often learns before they make the mistake. I don't have to ruin my life to get a testimony. I can learn from other people's mistakes. Potential depends on good luck. Harvest relies on hard work. Are you lucky? Or do you work hard? Which is it? Potential quits early and often. Potential will stay potential if you don't press through. Harvest perseveres. Haven't we heard that word before? Uh, in the, in, the, in the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, we talk about long-suffering. We follow it clear to the end. Harvest follows it to the end. Don't pick your stuff too soon. Potential falls into bad habits. Harvest fights against bad habits and forces yourself to good habits. I have the potential to be healthy. But boy, I like all the wrong stuff. I have to force myself. I don't understand why God made anything that's edible green. Think about it for a minute. Everything that's healthy it's green. I'm like, 
You know, I'm like Mark Lowry, cook it till the green's gone and cover it in cheese sauce. Yeah, but no, I have to do the right things. I have the potential to be healthy, but I've got to create good behaviors. Potential talks big. Watch the people that brag on themselves all the time because they're full of potential. They're so busy talking, they never accomplish anything. But harvest people follow through. They don't have to tell you how good they are, they show you. Potential plays it safe. Harvest takes risk. Potential thinks like a victim. Well, you know, I didn't have a dad. I didn't have this. I didn't have the other thing. So harvest thinks like a learner. Every situation I face in my life, did I grow up without a dad? Absolutely. It was a learning opportunity. Did I struggle here? Did I was, was I raised in poverty? It was a learning opportunity. That's what harvest says. Potential relies only on talent. But harvest relies on character. That one will preach for a long time. Potential stops after graduation. But harvest never stops learning. The theme scripture for my life, 2 Timothy 2.15 study. Well, we don't like that word, do we? Study for what? To show yourself approved. A workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Going through and taking your potential and following clear through to the end. See, I, I don't want to be people of potential. I want to be people of harvest. I want to be people of reality. I want the fullness of God in my life to be exposed so that what was potential for me becomes harvest for me. Because at that point, my potential becomes my prosperity in character, in relationships, in resources, and yeah, in money. Money won't make you happy, but boy, it sure does help. I mean, come on, we got to be real, right? You know, every people, nah, trust me, you might be miserable. And, and if you're miserable without money, you'll probably be miserable with money. But it's easier to be miserable with money. It's just easier. But listen, how do we, we take that potential, that thing that God placed inside of you, whether it's a business whether it's writing a book, whether it's inventing the next big thing, whatever that case may be, what is it gonna take from you to get your potential from inside of you to out in front of you where you can hold it? That's what God's asking of you. To take what's in you Get it out of you so you can hold it. And from that will come your prosperity. Because then you'll be satisfied. That's prosperous. Then you won't struggle with mental health. Because you'll think correctly about yourself. And but then you won't struggle financially. Because you will have followed and those things, that potential in you will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. What are his riches? Your potential. Your potential. There is greatness inside of you. Now, hopefully that frustrates you. Because a lot of times, you know, we hear that, oh, Brandon, you're great. And we go, boom head's big. No, no, no. I, what I said was, there's greatness inside of you. Now let's get it out. Let's get that greatness that's inside of you, out of you, so that you can become great in the kingdom of God. Amen? Father God, I love you. I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I am grateful for potential. 
But Lord, I'm also grateful for harvest. Help us to understand how to get the potential that's in us out of us to become our harvest, to become our blessing, to become our prosperity. Father God, this morning I submit everything to you and ask your blessing on the word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.